I'm Peter White. Welcome to the Inside Network. Welcome to In-Depth. I'm Peter White. My guest today is Tim Snellgrove, who's the Portfolio Manager for the Horizon Fund, a global long short listed infrastructure fund at the Costa Capital Company. Tim, welcome. Hi, Pete. Long short infrastructure. Why and why now? Basically, what we're trying to do uh, in regards to you know, our primary objective for clients is to consistently compound wealth over time. And uh, in, in saying that, um, minimise drawdowns and capital preservation. So um, the way we look at that is, uh, and the way to achieve that is globally in the one sector being infrastructure. So infrastructure already has uh, some safe and defensive attributes. So they're monopolistic, um, barriers to entry, uh, they've got you know, regulated returns, long contract life, uh, linked to inflation. And so you know, that predictability of cash flows uh, adds, a, adds a great defensiveness to the underlying earnings and to share prices. Where we look at things differently is, is the last aspect, how to actually truly protect downside. Um, and so in, in, we basically uh, allow ourselves uh, more tools to, to do that. So, and those tools being specifically long short. So exactly. So we're still looking at the sector the same. Uh, from a global uh, thematic point of view, being infrastructure, real assets, utilities. But the long short aspect is, uh, you know, benefits us in, in two ways uh, to achieve those objectives from a risk management point of view, as well as uh, new alpha opportunities. So, risk management means that we can, uh, by downside protection, we can offset um, the market risk um, and uh, we can control our net and gross exposure so we're not fully invested in the market all the time, uh, which is essentially an attribute of a, a long-only product in whichever sector it is, be it active or benchmark. The second thing is new alpha opportunities. So apart from the risk management, it means that you can create alpha and new trade ideas uh, in uh, unique and new ways in addition to uh, a long only point of view. So this includes pair trading um, where you know, your trade is for uh, the gap between two stocks to close, even if both go down, for example, you, you still make money. So opportunities like that uh, arise across the universe from a global point of view across infrastructure. And uh, it, you know, we believe those two points, risk management and new alpha opportunities, is, is what really is that final point in, in achieving those client objectives. Well, the question that's begged by what you're doing, it seems to me, is that not many people are doing this. this is, is, there's very few players doing long short in the infrastructure space. Uh, why is that and why do you have the confidence that this approach is going to work? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good point. It's a new product, particularly to the Australian market. Uh, not many people do it, you know, even offshore or from a global um, perspective. In regards to, uh, you know, why long short now and why others aren't doing it, 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 this sector took 10 years to establish itself as a traditional long-only sector, a part of clients' portfolios. And, and it now is. It's, a, it's, it's got over 150 bill US of FUM across you know, almost three dozen managers. But... Where I see is a difference is a lot of those defensive characteristics, the uh, lower vol, lower beta, you can get even lower vol and beta in the same sector with a long short. So is, is it a cultural thing in, th in terms of just the natural progression of the industry that people haven't gone to the next step, but you have? I, I, I think it is. I mean, you've seen it offshore, uh, particularly with sector-specific funds, financial funds, healthcare funds, where they see the value in a, either a regional or global sectoral approach where you can pick the eyes out of both winners and losers as opposed to just being a pure one-to-one -one exposure to a sector and riding through volatility. The main, you know, one of the main points we, we say is, you know, whilst defensive uh, and looking long-term, valuing things long-term as you should, that doesn't necessarily mean you should write out volatility and just look long term as you're sitting on a 20% month to date loss. So, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's that it, it is those 
drawdowns that hurt your compounding return over the long term. It, it seems to me that you're at the vanguard of tweaking a pretty established sector. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, I think so. So it's, I mean, it's, it's exciting for us and the feedback from clients, the way we look at, uh, look at this sector and the portfolio. The way we look at the sector is actually quite similar to a long only um, approach. It's, it's fundamental. It's bottom up in regards to the way it looks at the assets and cash flows. But you, you've got an extra, extra uh, uh, bullet tool, to fire. Exactly. We've, tool. Got, we've got a different tool in the toolbox. Um, from a risk management point of view and an alpha opportunity side. So, you know, we look at the same from a fundamental point of view, top down, bottom up, but, you know, we can now look at things relative to each other, to the market, in between the same sector or between sectors. So, and pair trading really is well established in other sectors, isn't it? It's not that people don't understand or it's that it's brand new. Exactly, You've exactly. You've just taken it to this sector almost. Yes, exactly. And particularly when, you know, you are a specialist in a sector, you're looking at a core sector of 80 to 100 stocks that may, you know, define out to 250 stocks on definition. But at the end of the day, you, you are um, looking at those stocks and the winners and losers and beneficiaries of, of many thematics and why not have the ability to look at, you know, some may be winners and losers, some may, some may um, have more priced in than others, some may be a longer or shorter term beneficiary of, be it macro developments, um, legislation, regulation. Well, before we come to the current events, let, just what are some of the themes running through the sector, the, the, listed, the global listed infrastructure sector at the moment as you see them? And this is a pretty good hunting ground at the moment, um, you know, for long short strategy in the space. So. You've got, you've obviously got COVID. Uh, so, um, you know, you've got a, a big dispersion across airports and toll roads. So toll road obviously picked up a lot more after lockdowns as people hit the roads again for work and for leisure. Uh, but on the airport side, you've also got, um, you know, a lot of differences between airports globally. So we had the vaccine news um, last week and the differentiation in the three days since has been between some names up 10%, other names up 65%. So A, that, that is a good hunting ground, but B, that just shows that things react to the same news um, differently. Some airports are more exposed to leisure travel than others. So with a vaccine, leisure should come on sooner than business trips. So, you know, even before the vaccine, Greek airports were pricing in a 60 to 70% airport passenger level to 2019 levels. That could be 80, 90%. Um, next year. So if you were looking at going to Mykonos next year for summer, you could go if you're allowed to leave Australia. So in saying that, you know, COVID, you've got the differences between, you know, airports and toll roads, their outlook, you know, with or with vaccine. So you're being selective on airports, obviously. Definitely. And, and definitely. And, you know, post COVID, you know, there, there has been, you know, run up in, in a lot of them that is pricing in pretty good outcomes for them. So there's obviously the election at the moment. Uh, and is, that, is the Biden apparent victory good for the sector? It is. I mean, both for the wider markets uh, in general. So you've got um, you know, pr a pretty, pretty good outcome in regards to there won't be any drastic changes on, on tax or legislation with a, with a Republican Senate. But, um, you know, he can still do a lot of things um, with uh, his clean energy goals uh, at the executive level. Uh, so with EPA, with... And you see that as a positive? Exactly. So, I mean, even if you look at some of his plans, even, even pre-election, uh, on some forecasts, uh, electric vehicles were going to go up to 54% penetration of miles in the US from 1% now by 2040. So in order to do that, um, you know, you need a lot more infrastructure for electricity generation, transmission grid, uh, as well as charging stations. In regards to that, to get to that number, we've only got 4% of those charging stations in the US now. Uh, and so pre-election, pre-actual, you know, Biden putting these plans, um, you know, in place, fuel emission standards, things like that, you know, $80 billion will have to be spent to put those charging stations in, in, in place. So there's a lot of winners. There's a lot of... Well, it's you know, interesting how the, the one headline was that Biden wasn't the market's favourite, but the market seems to like him and the, the Biden stock basket went up before the election. So it's, it's quite a confusing picture, isn't it? Well, it was to me. Yeah. And, and look, you know, whether we have the, the, a blue wave post the, you know, Georgia runoff in, in January, who, who knows? But at the end of the day, you know, not as, as drastic measures, I guess one question left in the market is the, the, the 
rotation from growth, which has been the big runner in the last few years, uh, to value and cyclical plays um, that we've seen in, in the market. You know, the jury is out on how long that last but you know in, in terms of in terms of the energy and green uh, stimulus that is a big thematic going through um, our sector so um, you know and and there are winners and losers so in utilities you know there's there's coal uh, coal fired plants that are being retired and they have to be replaced with new generation presumably you Long the the winners and short the losers. I'm yeah, and look, this is there. Are, there are differences. You know, it's not as clear as you cut. see them. Exactly, it's not as clear cut. There's some winners. Um, you know, state by state, some companies are, are essentially more levered to that upside. Even even without Biden's, um, you know, Biden being in in office, uh, just with the actual cost of. Uh, renewable generation going down, solar and wind, the cost is more than half since 2010, is for 70 gigawatts of coal-fired generation in the US, that will be economically redundant over the next 10 years. So that needs to be replaced. And that is about a third of the coal-fired generation at the moment. So they're, they're, they're big, huge numbers, big, big, big exactly, numbers. regardless yeah. of top-down. Well, just look at the sector that you're in or you've created, the global listed infrastructure, long, short. If you're, I'm an advisor, where do you tell me to put that? Which basket do I put it in? It's a global product at the end of the day. They're global stocks and the themes that run through the stock, which is an advantage, are common. The, the, the decarbonisation, green energy, you know, the impact of COVID on airports and toll roads. And the fact is you can value these assets similarly across regulation and regions. So that it is a global allocation. So you're saying that I should just put them in my global equities basket? Exactly. It's a global allocation. Uh, it's a, it's, it's within a, it can be within a global basket. It's a long, short approach to global equities, of which is a, a single uh, sector thematic. Traditionally as well, um, you know, some advisors have, have kept infrastructure long short as a, within, a, within the real assets component, i.e. the alternative buckets where the long only infrastructure sits. So that can be used because offensively, uh, essentially the long short product can offset the one-to-one -one exposure that the long only product is, is, is giving because essentially it is looking at the sector through different eyes and it will have a different return series. But your starting conversation is, hey, this is part, this, these are global equities we're talking about and really you should be very comfortable in putting them in that basket. That's the starting point you, you exactly. need to take, is it? Exactly. What's your investment process? How do you choose your uni universe of opportunities? So the universe is similar to existing definitions across other managers. So, so utilities, infrastructure, um, core assets, monopolistic, long-term cash flows. The same much. as if you were long only, really. It, it, exactly, and we don't we don't take that to a to an extra level, i.e., merchant or power risk. We're not. We're not playing in an expanded definition. It is the same definition. It is the same art. Is it fair to say you pay more attention to the ones that you don't like than others because you see them as a, as a, a source of alpha in the, in the way you manage? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess different to the way a traditional analyst or portfolio manager will think where, you know, the bottom of the return stack or it doesn't have the most positive catalyst looking at, well, okay, let's just forget about it, put it in the bottom drawer or we can look at that. And you try and make those characteristics work for you. Yeah, so we can, yeah, either from an out, outright absolute point of view that it may go down, but the, the other way to think about it will be, well, actually, versus a premium stock versus it, its peer, maybe it will outperform even if it actually has a negative value. Outlook. Let's talk for a moment about portfolio construction. How do you put your the, the horizon portfolio together? That's one of the key differentiators of the of the product and, and the way we, we view portfolio construction. And the, the core of it goes back to why we're doing it around uh, you know, compounding returns over the long time and downside protection. So we don't we are essentially style agnostic. We look at things, you know, top down, bottom up, and relative. We then translate that in terms of portfolio positions in our eyes is, is not just merely, you know, uh, uh, cheapest in regards to value and buying the cheapest and ignoring the bottom. We look at things in three categories. So um, we bucket things in terms of risk at um, pair trading, uh, opportunistic trading opportunities, 
and sector thematic trades. So, and can they vary? Are they equally weighted? Exactly. No, they're, they're all basically trade um, thesis dependent. So trades are put in there at a, a gross and net uh, relative to, to its expected return. Each trade that goes in there is there for a reason. It's there with a target return. It's there with an expected downside stop. It's there with catalysts and why that that spread or that stock or that pair will get to a certain level. You're not bound by any particular percentages of any of those three? No, no. and that, that's one advantage we see of the product versus a traditional product where you have min and max sector and regional levels. If you don't like a sector, you shouldn't be in it. Likewise, if you don't like a region, you shouldn't be there. So that um, ability to be active and unconstrained as well as having the extra tools on the short side is, is, a, is a benefit. So you really have a free hand and extra tools. Exactly. If you want to put it in layman's terms. Exactly. Yeah, well, right. short is unusual. So let's let's give me one of your, your best short ideas at the moment. Talk me through that. So we've had the vaccine announcements um, this week and you know a lot of enthusiasm for you know, return to travel. A lot of the share prices in airports uh, we think are actually pricing in you know too quick a return to the happy days. Uh, and in particular, for example, you know, in Japan. Um, and in Japan, a good way to play it is via the rails. So with a catalyst next year of the Olympics, the delayed Olympics. The hoped for Olympics. Exactly. And they're a beneficiary of that, that that travel um, should now return. I actually think that there is, there is still slim chance that the event goes ahead. If you look at surveys um, domestically, um, a third want to delay it again and a third don't want it at all. But also the fact is, is... You may have a vaccine, but you don't know about deployment. You don't know about testing levels. Who who can even get there? And likewise, um, the domestic uh, the domestic situation on how you actually enjoy the Olympics. So, for example, they're testing now at baseball games. Um, they've actually filled capacity stadiums, but uh, you can't get off your seat. You can't cheer. You can't clap. You can't rant now. If I was an international tourist having to go to Japan, would I really want to go and enjoy the Olympics in that situation? Not at all. So I don't think that there will be, um, you know, this return um, to domestic and international travel that a lot of those stocks are pricing in. And a lot of that rail network is exactly that. Shinkansen travel, all, all leisure tourism. So you're stocks. shorting the Japanese rail? Particularly on this bounce, I think that enthusiasm should wane soon. Where does ESG fit in your, your um, toolkit when you're looking long short? Is it the same as an, another manager or is it, are, there, are there nuances? Infrastructure and utilities are in a sweet spot of ESG investment. They are riding a wave of ESG momentum. So renewable investments, um, you know, coal-fired switching, utilities are in the middle of this, toll roads are in the middle of this. Airports, airlines are in the middle of this. The way, you know, and, and the other thing is a lot of these stocks, from my point of view, can actually go too far on just that um, momentum trade, which we've seen recently in the, even in the lead up to the election. For example, with Biden being elected, he's probably going to repeal a, a Trump policy which was banning um, ERISA accounts in the US investing in ESG funds. And they have a $10 trillion pool of assets. So, when those guys can now start allocating to ESG funds, that money will, will go back into these underlying stocks. That could create opportunity. Well, I was going to ask you about the regulatory scene, both globally and in the US. And what you're saying is the changes on the horizon are positive for the sector rather than negative. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. And look, each regulatory environment is different. Yes. There are different reset periods. Uh, some are stronger than others. But at, at the end of the day, you know, regulatory is really the core to a lot of these, um, you know, pricing um, structures and remuneration models. But, you know, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it is a very boring, steady state, linear uh, sector, because it's not. We saw in, in 2019, 2018, 2019, with the UK uh, election, and Corbyn said he would nationalise the electric uh, water utilities uh, if he came into power. Now, they were trading at 1.2 to 1.3 times RAB. He was going to pay uh, at or below RAB for them. So, you know, you saw uh, depressed share prices on essentially a political motive. Which turned out to be buying opportunities. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, 
And, and as well as just looking at it in terms of non-directional views, so just increased volatility, for example. So you don't necessarily need to be correct on the direction. Let's finish by talking about interest rates. They're virtually zero, negative in some places for a long time. They've come down in Australia. I would imagine that's, that's a, a, a bull point for what you're doing, is it not? There is a lot of difference between you know, when rates do rise, uh, what um, you know, forward-looking inflation expectations are, and really what that means for these stocks are not only in their actual changes in cash flows, how they're remunerated, how the market actually sees it being a positive, as well as the, the, the valuation impact. And that valuation can be theoretical, i.e. You know, for utilities, they're passed through to the, to the, um, the customer, or higher inflation, for example, um, there's a price escalator for toll roads. Now, that could be the case that you know, there aren't necessarily um, a, a direct negative impact on higher rates, but that necessarily may not be the market's take on that. Is it fair to say that the outlook for you is, and what you're doing is quite good? You've got a sane person in the White House. Hopefully, we've got the vaccine on its way and you've got people hungry for yield. Uh, could you ask for much more? Yeah, I agree. I mean, volatile times are great. These these thematics are not going away. Um, we're going into a new year with uh, you know un uncertainty around um, vaccine deployment. We have a Tokyo Olympics that um, you know is planned, but who knows if it if it goes ahead. Um, we've got uh, you know a lot of decarbonisation plans around the world. And all of these are adding opportunities, both on the long and short side, within sectors, uh, as well as across sectors within our space. Tim Snellgrove, thanks very much for talking to us today. It's been fascinating. Thanks, Pete. Cheers.